Genesis Battle of Champions is a tactical collectible card game in which you take on the role of a champion, battling against your opponent on a gridded board where you can both move around and attempt to cast spells, make attacks, summon allies to fight, all so that you can reduce your opponent's life points to zero. So what do you need to play? Well, first of all, you're gonna need a champion, and there are a lot of them, so you can look over the champions and find one that you think suits your play style. Next, you'll need to build a 50 card deck, which in this game is referred to as a timeline, with a maximum of 250 chi across the deck. More on chi in just a little bit. Your deck is gonna be made up of creatures and spells and other little tricks that you can throw at your opponent, like special maneuvers that you can use. And interestingly enough, in this game there is no duplicate card limit. You can run as many copies of a specific card as you want within your 50 card deck. One more quick thing about deck building. Before you start building your deck, take a look at the champion that you picked, and look down the right side of the card. Each champion has one or more affiliations they may be a part of. When building your 50 card deck, you may only use cards with those affiliations. Affiliations that that match your hero in some way. So with that under our belt, let's take a look at the cards within the game and talk about what you're gonna see on each type of card, starting with champion cards. Now, as I said before, there are a bunch of different types of champions within the game, all with their own unique flavor, stats, and play style. But let's go over what you're gonna find on each card. In the top left of every champion card, you're gonna find the health in the red banner. It's got a heart with it. As you can see on Rain's card, she has 18 health. The blue banner next to that one is her starting aura, which is the amount of resources she has to spend on things like casting spells, using effects, or bringing things in to fight alongside of you. The green banner next to the blue one is an energy reduction banner, and the number there basically allows you to do things at a discount. Some champions have energy reduction, some don't, but this will essentially reduce the cost of something that you're doing by that little number. The 3x3 grid in the top center is essentially an area of effect grid. It basically tells you what your champion can attack and where. The little silver arrow represents your champion and the way that they're facing, and any red dots within that grid represent where that champion can attack. The symbols on the right side of the card are the affiliations that your champion is a part of. As you can see, there are six different affiliations represented by six different colors and six different symbols, which makes it very easy to see which cards can go into which decks along with which champions. Don't forget that when you're building a deck or a timeline that you can only use cards from the same affiliation as your champion. And the last piece of information we find on champion cards are their actual abilities, and that's found in the bottom center. Some champions may have more abilities, some may have less, but they're all structured the same. The black boxed word on the left is the speed of the effect, and there's four different speeds, we'll talk about those later, but basically they're just different little trigger timings. The middle word is literally just what you're doing, it's the effect that you're performing, it's casting the spell, it's an attack. It's curing some damage. It's triggering a decoy to protect yourself. And the white boxed word on the right is the cost of the effect, what you have to pay or do in order to trigger this effect. Sometimes you pay in aura and you take some of the aura that goes along with your champion and you put it aside out of the game forever. Sometimes you have to pay in cards off the top of your deck and if you run out of cards in your deck you lose. Sometimes you have to pay in health of your champion. But everything there is spelled out nicely and easily from left to to right in trigger timing, the actual effect, and how you pay for it. Right below that information is some expanded information about what you're actually doing. For example, it may say something like, you deal three dark damage to a target in your awareness. And again, awareness is just the little red dots there up in the top center grid. So that's what champions look like. And spoiler alert, a lot of the other cards look very similar, if not almost exactly the same. For example, here is an earth elemental. This is a creature that can come on down into the battlefield and fight alongside of you, and in this game, creatures are actually referred to as summons. So you can see that this summon has three health there in the top left. You can see that it can attack and affect anything that is directly one square in front of it. Now on this card, there is a new little banner, a gray banner with a little different symbol. That symbol represents the chi that this card costs to put into your deck. Again, you're limiting your deck to 50 cards and 250 total chi, so if you wanted to put this card into your deck, that would take 
take up five of your chi. Again, on the far right, we have the affiliations that this card can kind of go into and fit alongside of. Something new that we see on this card is the subtype that's directly under the name. So Earth Elemental here is an elemental. And again, just like with the champion, there are effects there at the bottom. The only one I'm gonna talk about here is the action effect, that very first one on the card. You use this effect at action speed and it is a beckon. The word beckon basically means to call this summon onto the field to help you in battle. Again, creatures are referred to as summons, so from now on I'll call them that as well. Beckoning is how you bring a creature out, so you always want to look at how you're going to beckon something, and at what speed that you can beckon something, and how much it's going to cost to beckon something when deciding if you want to play that card. Speaking of speeds, there are four different speeds. There's the action speed, the swift speed, which is the most important one in my mind, the continuous speed, and the trigger speed. Action speeds can only be played during the champion or the summon's main phase, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Swift speed abilities can be played during the main phase or during the end phase or right at the end of the round. They can also respond to other abilities. So in my mind, they're the most important to understand. Continuous speeds are happening all the time and triggered abilities happen when a condition is met. Pretty straightforward overall. So that's what champion and summon cards look like. You'll also come across cards like spells and enchantments, but really they all work the same way and they're all templated the same way. So once you kind of understand how one card works, you can really grasp how all of the cards work. Okay, so let's get set up for a game. First things first, grab yourself a 5x6 play mat and lay it to where both of the five-sided sides are facing the players. If you don't have a 5x6 gridded play mat, then I would recommend looking for and picking up a Genesis Battle of Champions beta two-player starter set. There's one in the box, as well as everything else you'd need to play the game and a couple of booster packs in there just for good measure. Next up, you and your opponent need to grab your champions from your deck and put it in the very center spot closest to you. Grab some way to keep track of your life or your health, maybe grab some dice and put them off to the side, or get an app that you can use as a life tracker and get that dialed up. Make sure you've shuffled your deck and then also double check that you have all of the aura that you need. And don't forget, aura is your resources in this game. You start out full of resources and the more things you do, the more you spend your aura to do those things. So make sure you have that ready to go. Once you've got all that set up, then go ahead and draw yourselves five cards. From here, just pick someone to start and you are ready to play. So one of the many cool things about Genesis is that it's not played in turns, but really played in rounds. Play passes between both players one at a time and each player takes a turn taking some sort of an action, either playing a card from their hand or moving one of their characters around. So let's talk through a round and how it works. At the start of a round, both players will draw a card and then remove any little tokens called exert tokens off of any of their cards in play. Don't worry too much about what exert tokens are. They're basically just tokens you put on your cards once you've used them. More on that in a little bit. Once both players have done that, the player who was chosen to start will select one of the cards on the board that they control and enter their move phase. By the way, that starting player will start every single round. It doesn't alternate. So when you're in your move phase, you can either choose to advance or you can choose to just stay still. Advancing looks like this. You can move in any one of the four directions, either left or right or forward or backwards if there is a spot, and you can also rotate 90 degrees one way or 90 degrees the other way. You could do those in combination, so you could move forward and then rotate 90 degrees to the left, or you could move to the right and rotate 90 degrees to the right, or you could even just stand still and rotate 90 degrees one direction. All of those count as advancing. Now normally when you advance you move one square, but if you choose you can move two squares in any direction, but doing so would push you directly into your end phase, meaning you don't get to do stuff in your main phase like beckoning in summons or casting spells, stuff like that. So once the creature you've chosen to go through their move phase is finished, they generally then go to the main phase. In the main phase you're allowed to play any action abilities or swift abilities and you can play as many of them as you want until you're done. So for example, as an action, I could beckon this earth elemental from my hand and put it in the field following the instructions there in the text box for 13 aura. I'd take 13 aura off my little stack, I put it out of the game forever, and now I have an earth elemental to fight alongside of me. Now when it enters the battlefield, it will become exerted, and this is just like summoning sickness in magic, it just can't attack or do things right away. You show that it's exerted by putting an exert 
token on top of the card. So after I bring the Earth Elemental into play, I could also play another action from my hand, something like Dedicated Studies, which comes in at action speed, it's a cast effect, and instead of paying resources in the form of aura, you're paying resources in the form of taking the top two cards from your deck and discarding them. That's what that little fire looking symbol represents there in the white box. After you pay that cost, you get to do the effect, which is draw two cards, then discard two cards. And then once you do that, you could continue playing cards from your hand until you want to stop. And don't forget, you start with every resource at your disposal. You have access to all of your aura from the beginning. So if you wanted to, you could dump your entire hand on the first turn of the game. But is that good? That's the question that you're posed with every single turn. Is it better to dump your hand and only refill at the beginning of your turn with one card, or should you be more judicious with your resources as you position yourself around the board throughout the fight? So once you've played all of the abilities that you want to, either from hand or with characters on board, you then move to your end phase. The end phase is your final chance to use any swift ability. Swift abilities can happen right here at the end phase, and after you finish using any of your swift abilities, that character that you you've been using during this turn is exerted. So what would that look like during a turn? Well, let's say you're playing as Rain and you've done all these things that we mentioned. You summoned some stuff, you cast some spells, maybe you moved around a little bit, but you haven't used Rain's first ability, which is a swift dark attack three that exerts her to use it. Well, if you've waited until the end phase, you can actually, as you end your turn, use this effect. You exert her by putting a little token on her and you use the dark attack three ability, which deals three damage to a target in your awareness, which means any target in one of those little red dots in the top center of Rain's card. So after you've done that, you then pass over to your opponent who chooses one of their things on the board and goes through the exact same process. They move it by advancing or staying still. They go to the main phase if they didn't advance twice during their move phase. They can use actions or swift abilities or they could just pass. And then they go into their end phase where they use any last little switch abilities that they want to. Then when they finish with the character that they chose, they pass back to you and you would select any character that is not exerted and go through the same process. And play passes back and forth bouncing from player to player. You keep going through the same sequence until everything on the board is exerted. So in other words, you may choose to move rain during your first turn and then you pass over and your opponent moves their champion and they pass over and then you move one of your characters like the earth element elemental that you brought in during the last round and it's no longer exerted. Now he can move around and attack and do things and you pass over to your opponent and they move one of their summons around and attack with it as well. You keep doing this until everything on the board has an exert token. Once that happens the round is over and a new round begins from the beginning. Both players draw a card, everybody takes the exert tokens off and the player who was selected at the beginning of the game to go first kicks off a new round by selecting one of their things on the board to go through that process again. Move, main phase, end phase. And this is how the game plays. Turn by turn, round after round, you keep trying to outmaneuver, outposition your opponent, taking out their summons, beckoning your own summons to fight alongside of you, casting powerful spells, making acrobatic maneuvers, all the while trying to reduce your opponent's health to zero, or hoping that you can outlast them until their deck runs out of cards. So those are the basics of how to play Genesis Battle of Champions. It's a really cool take on a trading card game and a wonderful match up between trading card games and tactical miniature battles. If you like this video or if you got anything out of it at all, please consider giving me a like and a subscribe. Let me know in a comment below if you'd like to see more content featuring Genesis Battle of Champions. I tried to keep this nice and succinct so that you could get in, get what you needed and get out without getting bogged down into the details. So there are a few things that I left out and skimmed over that I did save for a second follow-up video to this one. So if you'd like to see that, let me know in a comment below and as always thanks for watching.